everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it happens to be, wherever you are. Welcome back to another Ask an Expert session. We are thrilled to have you. This autumn, we kick, out, we kick off with a very special guest that knows everything about storytelling, communications, and climate action. In today's session, Indra Hirkins, our strategic communicator for the Climate Action Program, talks with the highly appreciated expert, George Marshall, founder and director of IKEA Foundation's partner, Climate Outreach. But that's not all. This session is all about communication, so let yourself be heard. If you have any questions for George, this is your chance. You can easily drop them online on social, so don't hesitate to climate reach out. For now, I'd like to welcome Indra to introduce our guest of honor. Hey, Indra. Hey, Ryan. Thank you so much. I'm very, very uh, thrilled to do this session for you today. At the IKEA Foundation, we help families create a better everyday life and protect the planet. The Climate Action Team supports partners that help reduce greenhouse gas emissions so our planet can stay under 1.5 degrees of warming. And as the comms lead of the Climate Action Team, I'm deeply honored to having this interview with one of our partners and the most leading experts on climate communications, George Marshall from Climate Outreach. Welcome, George. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Hi, Indra. Hi. <laughs> Hi, George. So I remember very well when I first saw you as a keynote speaker during a festival in Amsterdam. You stood there on stage in the way you took the entire audience on your journey to talk about climate change. That was really amazing. Could you share with me where all that tremendous passion comes from? You know, I used to, I started working for many, many years on, on forests, especially rainforests, uh, fighting for the rights of indigenous people in rainforests. And around the, the late 90s, um, the new research started coming through to show that all of the areas I was most passionate about, especially the Amazon, were severely under threat from climate change. I thought, crikey, you know, we're fighting so hard to stop logging, to stop mining, and there's this massive threat that could actually burn the whole thing up. And so that's really what got me into it. And then I decided around 2000, I would work on nothing but climate change for the rest of my life, which is a great decision because you can't really do anything wrong. If you do something wrong, you can learn from it and roll on to the next thing. Um, and I then did a lot of public speaking. And I remember uh, the, the next kind of key thing for me was when I was giving a, a big environmental conference talking about climate change. And there were only three people in the room. And one of them, when I started talking, got up and walked out. And then one of the two remaining people, all he wanted to do was to keep interrupting me and telling me how what we needed to do was to show our backsides to people in power. It's what the Maoris did. And um, I was furious, but I went, OK. Obviously, I'm speaking to wrong people, A, but also B, what is it about climate change which is not making people more concerned? And really, that's been the, the center of my work. How do we get people engaged and how do we speak to new audiences? So, yes. Um, so in 2004, as a result of that, I think you founded Climate Outreach, <laughs> uh, the first British charity to focus exclusively on public engagement with climate change. And a lot has happened since. Can you describe the differences in climate conversations now and then? You know, the, the big problem that we faced for many years was climate silence. Uh, we wrote the first report on, on climate silence where people would know about it, but they just weren't talking about it. They weren't, uh, it wasn't appearing in conversations. And we know that's so important. You know, people really only start to get involved with something when they're hearing about it from their friends and their family, people around them. That's changed. I think there really is a strong public conversation about climate change now. Um, there's a lot of talking, maybe too much talking but at a government level, because now we have a huge amount of attention, but we're not seeing the action that, that goes with it. And I think we've now moved maybe from a situation of not talking about it to many people feeling some, some concern and despair. We have to find that way of tipping people over into the action. But the other thing that, that has definitely changed is that when I started working on this issue, people would say, yeah, that's a problem in the future. You know, that's a, that's a big problem. And that's for future generations. You know, I'll be long dead when that comes in. And they said this again and again in focus groups. It's a kind of denial mechanism where they, they avoid it by, by pushing it away. And that has now changed. In all of the polling that is being done now, large majorities of people saying it's here, it's now, it's going to happen in my lifetime, it's, it's going to affect me. I think that's a real um, that's a that's a real kind of like you know psychological step, but we still have a problem, and in many countries we had a, a, a wide polarization of attitudes. We had a lot of divides 
they haven't gone away you know in some places like the us i think they've even gotten worse so we still have a lot of challenges there Yes, yes, George, I fully agree. And talking about challenges and talking, um, hey, audience, this is a live session, nice. and mm -hmm. you are welcome to ask any questions to George about climate and communications as you like. So please st stand up and engage with us. Um, in the meanwhile, um, I have another question for you because no, I know that you are also an expert in the psychology of climate change, and you are the author of this wonderful book called don't even think about it, why our brains are wired to ignore climate change. Um, why do you think climate change is so hard to us to accept on take or take action on? Oh, thank you for asking me that. And, and yes, please, anybody listening, do ask questions. I, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I, I spoke to some of the world's leading experts in, in, in psychology, people, Nobel Prize winners, people who are uh, very skilled in this. And, and the message kept coming through again and again, but unfortunately, climate change is a combination of things we're not very good at. It's not impossible for us, you know, there's a big climate movement, there's people who are involved, but it's not easy because it has a, a range of things that we don't engage with well. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, well, originally and, and it's changing now, but, but not here and now. I, I mean, and even now, the, the big effects are always down the line in the future. It's something catastrophic. It's very hard for us to imagine, but we've never faced anything like this as a, as a, you know, as humanity before. So it's something quite new, and it involves costs. You know, we're really bad at costs. We like to push those things away. I I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I always leave it to a very very last minute. You know, like five minutes before midnight before I put in my tax return. You know, <laughs> and I think we're all like that. I think when something is a cost. We, we avoid it. If it's something which is a benefit, you know, someone's going to do something for us, bang, we act on it immediately. And that makes it hard. It's uncertain too. It's uncertain. It's not uncertain, but it's happening, but it's uncertain how it will affect us, who it will affect. And I really think the big problem and the one we struggle with in communications is this one around a narrative, finding a mm -hmm. way to talk about it. Because, you know, we, we actually, all of us, make sense of a world through stories that's something which is in our brains if we say wired it's absolutely wired into who we are all cultures in the world do this and it's hard to make a climate narrative and i think one of the reasons for that is is that we respond very well when there's an enemy you know when there's something out there that is attacking us or wants to make harm to us and climate change doesn't have that climate change is caused by us living our lives uh, and often caring for and loving for people, you know, putting food on the table, driving our kids to school. Um, yeah, we're talking here, obviously, about the, the high polluting countries or, or just getting by. I mean, I, I, you know, I often think if climate change was being caused, for example, by North Korea, imagine North Korea was pumping gases into the atmosphere that would change in the world's climate. There would never have been 30 years of governments and especially, you know, like kind of, you know, Trump and George Bush and so on saying, uh, you know, they weren't going to do anything about it because we take immediate action because it would fit into that kind of enemy narrative. So I think it's hard, you know, it's like, um, it's like jelly, it's like a shapeshifter. It's hard to grasp. And, and I think the really important thing is it looks different for different people because we see it through the lens of who we are, our identity. And that means that for different people, it looks different and it has a different shape and feel. And that means we have to find a way that it can fit with who people are. But the other side of that, of course, is if you look at this through the lens of your values and you say, this isn't me, this isn't my values, I don't trust the people who are telling me, people reject it. And that's another big problem we have with climate change that makes it very hard, is we see it through the story and the values and the, the way it's told to us. And if we don't hear it in the way that speaks to who we are, we push it away. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, so... It's, it's not easy. And I think, you know, it's, it's really, uh, we have to find a way where, where everybody can feel part of it, can see that they can make a contribution. And we have to have, we have to have everybody on for this. Right. And, and as you, as I can elaborate a little bit more on the fitting of the narrative, um, some people think, or some experts say that climate change uh, shouldn't be discussed at all. It shouldn't be a part of the narrative. You should address 
I, uh, things to people that, that, that maybe is of benefit for theirs. So for instance, when you're talking about money, maybe we can change this into something that you can gain money with, for instance, with uh, you know, your own electricity uh, kind of plant with, with your solar panels, or for others that's more related to their environment uh, that they live in. Um, do you agree? Not really, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I think obviously, like I said, one of the problems is a cost. So it's good if there's a benefit. But generally speaking, making money is actually not that much of a motivation for people. The motivation for people is maybe what goes with that. You know, being able to uh, maybe having status for some people or maybe, uh, or maybe, you know, having more resources, being able to care for their family. You know, money is just a, in some ways a, a symbol. And I think the important thing is to find the rewards that speak to people. And maybe for some people, money is a reward. But my experience is for most people, the reward is being who they are, is mm -hmm. feeling that what they are is worthwhile and valuable and, and that by taking action on climate change, they become more that, like they get more recognized in their group. And so therefore, you know, the messaging will be very different for different people. If you're talking with, mm -hmm. you know, if we're talking with somebody of strong religious faith, for example, it's not gonna be money that motivates them. It's gonna be that taking action on climate change brings them closer to their to their God or their gods or, mm -hmm. or takes them further along their spiritual path, you know, for, uh, for some people, it might be that climate change helps to strengthen their community or to bring people together. For some people, it might be that it's it's a patriotic thing. It's something for their country. So, you know, I think there's a lot of positive messages that don't have to be about money, actually. So we, I, we actually have some questions from the audience. And the first oh, is from Elizabeth saying, hi, George, my family does a good job at easy home sustainability, energy saving, recycling, because it is so personal. How can I motivate them to take bolder steps in their neighborhood? You know, it, it's and if for some people, some people are like entrepreneurs, they like to make things happen. And then for them, it's kind of easy. They can do things because they just do it. They say, right, let's let's organize this group. You know, let's let's go and talk to our 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 member of parliament. You know, let's take action. I think it's harder if if you are uh, more more modest and you're looking for things that you can do. But one thing I would say, and this is very important, is that climate change is not just about climate and it's not even just about carbon. There are so many things which are related to it. So, so I'd say look more widely at what those things are. We'll maybe talk a little later about the importance of clean air, for example. Um, uh, I'm I'm working with a, a small town um, close to me, encouraging people to turn off their engines, especially outside schools, because the the bad air is bad for the children. Now that's a good climate change thing. You know, actually, we call this idling, where people run their engines without reason. It's actually a very very inefficient and wasteful. And I think that's a conversation. We can have a conversation about uh, people on low incomes or poor people have problems. Um, uh, heating their homes. That's a wider conversation in the area. I think we can certainly talk about food waste. And if Elizabeth, if any of your of your family are involved in a, a workplace, for example, or a restaurant or somewhere that deals with food, dealing with that kind of food place, uh, that, that kind of food waste is really important. I think, I think finally, like, let's recognize that we have many different um, spheres in which we, we, we work, many, many ways our lives interact. Yes, we have home, but we also have our community, but we also have the workplace. We also have all of the organizations that we're involved with. And these are all opportunities. And I'll talk with this right at the end, probably, but I think the most important thing is to start a conversation. That's what I'd say, Elizabeth. Like The really bold step is to start talking with the people around you. Well, thanks so much for this answer. Um, so the IKEA Foundation supports your program to help government uh, uh, to, um, to, to engage with citizens uh, around climate change. So why is this important? Well, first of all, can I say thank you so much to the IKEA Foundation for, for its support? Um, and actually, we're not talking about it now. Maybe you can interrupt. But the IKEA Foundation supports a lot of 
organizations that are doing really important work on engagement is one of the things you're so strong on. And let's talk about engagement then for a moment. Um, it's important to say that engagement is different from communications. Communications is a part of engagement. Right? It's like education is a part of engagement. But when we say engagement, we say we say it's about this. It's about it's about reaching out to people so that they take hold of this issue. And that means a two way conversation. Engagement is also about listening. It's about going, asking people, what are you concerned about? What do you care about? Listening to them and then responding back in a way that speaks to who they are, to, to, to their identity and, and their values. And um, that's important because people do not feel connected on this. They do not feel that they're involved or participating in, in in, in this issue, they feel quite, you know, pushed out. People are always saying, what can I do? They shouldn't be having to ask what they can do. They should be very actively involved in what they can do. So what we've been doing with the, with the IKEA Foundation is really an initiative to, to take this up a level, to say, look, people actually have a right to know and they have a right to be involved. And I think that's a, that's a human right. That's like a, a moral right. People have a right to be involved in what is happening. I'd say in lower income countries, it even goes further than that. People have a right to know what's coming along because if they don't, they could be very severely affected. And we have worked in climate outreach. We've worked across the world, including in remote parts of India, across North Africa. And I must say it is very disturbing when you go out there. People know the weather is changing, but they have no idea of what is coming down the line. So people have a right to be told but people have a legal right, and this is the other thing, but with your help that we're, we're saying to the governments, we're saying, look, when you sign the, the Convention on Climate Change, when you sign the Paris Agreement, you signed on to specific, um, specific content in there saying that you would go and educate and inform and engage and enable citizens to participate in policy. And you really haven't done a very good job on that. And you need to do that. It's 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 people's right to have that now if i think i think that the uh i think you know when you say you know why is it important for governments i think there's some great work being done by civil society organizations charities reaching out there which is fantastic but, you know they also deserve support and funding and recognition from the governments of, of what they're doing um so really what we're doing is we're trying to take it up a level. We're trying to say, look, this is important. You can do it. Here are some examples of what works. You promised to do it, so we're going to insist that you do it. We're going to have a lot of discussions at this big climate negotiation in, in Glasgow where they're discussing what they're going to do. And finally, the really important point we can make to governments is that if you are going to take strong climate action, you need a, a mandate. You need public support for doing this. And if you don't get that support, it can go horribly horribly wrong and we've seen in uh, this repeatedly you know like in australia they uh, they brought in a uh, they tried to bring in uh, carbon pricing uh, uh, you know to put a price on carbon to in order to to fund climate change programs and it brought down the government you know in france they did a terrible job on public communications they tried to put out carbon pricing and then the gilets jaunes the <laughs> yellow vests um had a mass movement of opposition because Quite understandably, nobody had ever tried to engage them in what was happening and why. And we see this again and again. So we'd say, look, it's, this, isn't a, this isn't something we would like to have. This is something we need to have. And I'd finally say, look, we, we've just gone, we're, well, we're still in this horrible COVID experience. You cannot get people to vaccinate themselves or you cannot get people to wear a mask unless they feel involved. Same with climate change, I think. Exactly. So we have a very interesting question from the audience um, uh, yes, from somebody from West Papuan um, oh, hello. Say, uh, saying, I'm an indigenous West Papuan, which is, uh, why is it that climate change is hardly seen from an indigenous perspective, whereas they have been the ones suffering the most from climate change? I, I think you're totally right. I think that uh, indigenous people are on the front line uh, and you know, I've worked for many, many years with indigenous communities. Uh, I think the, I think the reckon, I think the reality is, of course, as as you would know, especially from West Papua, is that the reason, uh, you know, the reason not seen from an indigenous perspective is because indigenous people are pushed to the edge of um, 
of politics and policy and decision making, um, both in their own countries and, and internationally. You know, it's 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 absolutely essential that we allow a true diversity of voices. And at the moment, we do not have that. And I would say I would utterly support um, the right. Again, I think it's a right. These are, these are human rights, the right of Indigenous people to be heard on this, and the right of Indigenous people to be supported and protected from the impacts of climate change. And especially, I don't know how it is in West Papua, but I know in Papua New Guinea, there are, there are whole islands out of the coast of Papua New Guinea that are already starting to go underwater. This is appalling. This is a crime. And uh, at the very least, there should be international support for helping those people. But really, what should be happening is we shouldn't be having the climate change. So we need their voices and your voice indeed to be. Heard. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, talking about um, success, um, could you give me a tangible example of, of a successful implementation, a result of climate communications? We. Um, um, I mean, here's maybe one from our own work in climate outreach. We had a, a problem in uh, in Britain with political polarization, uh, and many countries have that. Um, I, I know in Scandinavia, um, it's a big problem, of course, in the US and continues to be um, Australia, uh, Canada, and so on. Um, and we started as an organization arguing and putting the case that we had to do a much better job of reaching across the political perspective you know because the environmental movement tends to speak very much to the liberal and left side and we needed to broaden it and this has been an ongoing program i think what's really important is that not only have we been encouraging and supporting in many ways people to have a different way of talking trying to speak to new audiences in new ways but we've also been backing that by research so we can go and say, look, we've tested this language. We know that this works well, and we know that this reaches wider. And this has been part of a continuing program for around you know, five years now of feeding this new way of thinking and talking, these new narratives into the public discourse. And I think as a result of that, we've seen very well um, uh, a decline in the polarization. And you know, we have conservative governments. Now there is a, a space for conservative governments to say climate change is a very conservative thing to do which helps them to move into that space. Well, it isn't conservative, it's not left-wing or right-wing, it's everything, but it helps politically. I think if I can say like a, 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 you know, another example, which is kind of interesting, because it's a comparison, is Canada, for example, has many different provinces. The, some provinces engage their citizens well and some do not. So within a country, you can see the changes. Alberta, uh, where I've done a lot of work, has done a very bad job on engaging its citizens. It's extremely polarized. There's a lot of opposition to climate change. But Quebec, for 20 years, has steadily and slowly been informing the citizens, helping them to be involved, truly engaging them. And you can now see statistically a huge, huge difference in levels of support for action on climate change, understanding of the issue, support for political action. So over time, you can see it. Of course, finally, the reason we have so many young people involved with climate change is because for 20 years, maybe 30 years, it's been on their educational curriculum. They've been learning about it at schools. And once you learn about it, you want to take action. That's why we have this huge difference now between young people and old people, is that young people have grown up with it and been taught about it and feel that they know about it. So we can see the evidence, I think, everywhere. Yeah. Maybe elaborating a little bit on that, we have a question yeah. from Edgar. Please. It says, hi, George, where do you see the biggest gaps in the climate narrative so far? Oh, I think I think the gaps are actually mostly about um, audiences. So it is certainly true there are gaps in the narrative. I think for the, the let, let's start with a narrative. I think the big gap in the narrative is that we tend to be over focused on these very technical uh, business opportunity kind of um, arguments because that is appealing to people in power. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's something which is kind of exciting in many ways. I think we don't talk, I don't think we talk very much about the opportunities for bringing people together, for having stronger communities. I think there's quite a big gap in the narrative about climate impacts. You know, we've been very focused on getting emissions down, especially in the high emitting countries. Um, we haven't talked really enough about how to prepare for the impacts that are coming. 
And again, this is a way of bringing people together. You can say, well, this is going to be happening. How can we come together? How can we support and help each other through these problems? So I think, you know, like I said, I think we have a right to know. Yeah. I think I think people haven't had that haven't had that right to know. Mm. And then I think finally we need to recognise that across the world there are huge numbers of people who haven't been involved. So the big gap, I think, especially in the countries with with low resources, has been actually just reaching out to people and saying this is what's going to happen. But in our own country, like yeah, a lot of people are concerned about climate change, but there are big sections of the population who are not who do not feel involved. I think. That's no. the, the well. Point. Um, talking about involvement, we have a question from Emma, who is a fan, I think, already, because she asks how she can get engaged in um, climate outreach. Oh, well, thank you. Well, please go to the website, climate <laughs> outreach, and, um, and uh, you know, and see what we do and join the newsletter. I mean, we're not a membership organization. What we do is we support membership organizations. So, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, there may be ways for, for but um, you know that that you can get involved with us. We'd love to hear from you. But um, we uh, we are actively, really, we kind of try and sit behind the scenes and encourage and enable other people to go out there and and, uh, and do things. I'd like to flag up. Um, um, we've uh, we've just launched. I mean, this might be a very nice way of being involved. We've just launched a, a big new initiative to support climate images. So images we the you know the, the you know the cliche is that uh, you know a, a picture is worth a thousand words. We have uh, we have a whole directory of images we've just selected. We had twenty five thousand um, no sorry five thousand applications and we picked out a hundred really good images which we've just put up on a website called Climate Visuals. So have a look at Climate Visuals and see if you can use those. Put those on your Twitter or or put those, if you're working on climate change, use them in your work. They're all free to use. And let's start to let's start to build not just words and narratives, but also you know, new images. Use them, please. Emma, I can totally recommend this. I'm a big fan of climate visuals, and especially, specifically on Instagram, you can have these wonderful images out, out there. So um, this session almost comes to an end. And what I um, want to ask you is to actually to help us, the audience, uh, to take home for us a top three of do's when it comes to talking about climate with family, friends, uh, co colleagues, maybe customers. Can you can you give us that? I'm going to give you four. <laughs> the, the, the first one, which I wish I'd said earlier, is it does not have to be about climate. So you can talk with people. I, I did say this earlier about things, for example, like clean air. You know, and one of the big communication successes has been around clean air as a way to talk about, um, you know, getting out of coal, for example, or shifting to electric cars. So, you know, it can be about clean air or it can be about health or, you know, yeah, it can be about, uh, we, we talked a little earlier, you know, about uh, people making money from solar panels. Like sometimes people, especially kind of like, you know, men like me, get very excited by the thought of a piece of technology with lots of flashing lights. So talk about things which don't have to be about, about climate change, but are connected. And I'd give you kind of three things as well. If you're speaking to people in your friends and family, first of all, this is very, very important. This is how social change happens, is when you talk to the people around you. So respect them. Yeah? Don't, don't get into some huge argument. Respect who they are. Respect for fa the thing that they might have their own ideas, their own finding their own way. They might not be all the way along there yet. Even climate deniers, they're still on a journey. So respect them. That's one thing. I think listen as well. So don't just... Don't just say, you've got to listen to me. This is so important. But also say, how do you feel about this? What do you think about what's going on? And really listen. That's also a way of getting better at communications is to listen. I think the final thing is what I would always say is speak from how you feel. I'd say speak from the eye. You know, don't say climate change. It's this big problem, this thing over here. Say, this is how I feel. It's not easy. It's, it's, it's hard. And this is how I this is what I think, and this is how I came to take action on it. So just speak always from that personal thing. And you'll find that you can make a bridge that way with anybody. Believe it, I do it all the time. 
well, sometimes this is how I feel, but uh, I think <laughs> this is really, really useful uh, advice. Well, thank you so much, George, for this wonderful conversation. Um, and um, taking this back to Ryan to round this up. Yeah, thanks so much, George. Your your passion obviously comes through, and we're we're very lucky to have had you today. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with our audience and give a little bit on this topic, which uh, can be so interesting and frustrating for us at the same time. So I think uh, again, tell us your website. So it's climateoutreach.org, or or as I also mentioned, it's climatevisuals.org. Great. So Thank please you. make sure to check that out. I think the climate visuals are very interesting. So I'm going to be looking at that as soon as we finish up here. If you have any other questions, you can, of course, drop them in the comments here. And we'll keep an eye on it for the next day or two and try and answer some questions if you uh, if you add them. So if you're watching a replay over the next couple of days, drop your question in the comments and uh, and we'll try and keep an eye. And we'll reach out to George if there's a question that we uh, we want to get him to help us answer. With that, we just want to thank everyone very much for coming back to Ask an Expert. As I said, we're back for the first one uh, after a little summer break. So really great to, to have you back. And we hope to see you come back for another session soon. So big thanks, George. Thanks, Indra. Have yourselves a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.